fantastic. Welcome. Okay, okay. thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Um, well, hello, hello, everyone. Um, I wish I could have been with you today. I wish we could have all been mm. um, sitting together uh, in um, in Munster. But I'm uh, very much with you all in in spirit, and I hope that you've been having a brilliant uh, brilliant morning already. Um, <clears throat> so I am uh, going to be talking about the fashion industry and the uh, impact of the fashion industry on people and on planet uh, today. So on September the 11th, 2012, a fire broke out in a five-story building in Karachi, Pakistan. Now, this factory had no functioning fire alarm. There were not enough fire extinguishers, there were bars on the windows, and there were also not enough fire escapes. And some of the fire escapes that there were, were even locked. And none of this was legal. None of this was legal anywhere in the world, let alone in Pakistan. You know, Pakistan has some strict building regulations um, designed to prevent fires from spreading, and all of these were being broken. But despite this, a shiny, beautiful safety certificate had been awarded to the factory by an Italian firm called Rena Services, who just weeks weeks before the fatal fire had certified this factory as safe. Now, the factory needed this certificate in order to impress like its big, respectable clients, including the German retailer, Kik. Yet, this certificate, this little piece of paper, was absolutely useless and worthless. And so, as the fire spread through this building, 259 garment workers lost their lives. Now, this is the story of Ali Enterprises. And I wanted to start with it today because we have literally just passed the eighth anniversary of this fire. And also because it's very connected with a very big German brand, Kik. Now, eight years on, the families and the survivors of the Ali Enterprises fire are still fighting for justice. And horribly, it took Kick over four years to provide long-term compensation to the families of the survivors. And now there is an ongoing case against Rena Services, the company that issued this useless certificate. So two years ago, a coalition of NGOs trade unions and the Ali Enterprises Factory Fire Effectees Association, so a group of uh, the survivors and the families of people who were killed, they filed a complaint against Rena Services to the Italian office of the OECD. And what they're doing is they are urging Rena to publish its report, like publish, how on earth did you certify this uh, factory as safe and also to make amends for the 259 deaths. Now, the horror of Ali Enterprises exposes the exploitation and the violence that is at the heart of the fashion industry. And what we see time and time again is that fashion is a system where multinational corporations outsource and ignore really basic safety standards, workers' rights, and safe and fair conditions. And as I'm sure many of you know, Ali Enterprises is far from the only factory fire or building collapse that has taken place um, right at the heart uh, of this industry. Um, I'm sure a lot of you also know that fashion is also incredibly environmentally damaging. And I thought, you know, we could uh, pause for a moment and talk about cotton. Because cotton is a, a really interesting crop. It's grown in over 80 countries. And the production of cotton supports the livelihood of about 350 million people. So it's a lot of people, you know, many times more people. It's about 60 million people who work in the, in the garment industry, as you know, in the factories 
uh, and around the world. So 350 million people work in cotton production. And in terms of the surface of the planet, only 2% of the land is allocated to, crop, uh, to cotton crops. But cotton uses 25% of the world's pesticides and 11% of the world's insecticide. So it's very, very, very imbalanced. And um, another thing about cotton and its environmental impact is that it is an incredibly thirsty product. Um, it takes about uh, 1,600 liters of water to grow the cotton it, it takes to make one pair of jeans. So 1,600 liters of water for one pair of jeans. And then of course, you don't just have to grow the cotton, then you have the dyeing and the finishing process and then jeans, you know, get washed at home. And so that takes another estimated uh, 1600 litres of water. And one of the things that I think makes these figures, you know, the 1600 litres of water, I, one of the things I think makes these figures even more intense is when we think about the fact that over a billion people on our planet, a billion people today don't have access to clean, safe drinking water. Um, and yet, you know, we are using it, using fresh water over and over again to, uh, to create jeans and t-shirts um, and so on. And the horrible thing about fashion is that the water that's used by these factories gets so polluted with chemicals that it becomes undrinkable and it becomes you know unusable and then if you in uh, countries like china for example it is just pumped out of the factories through these big waste pipes and is poured into rivers and lakes so then you end up with highly poisonous blue rivers um, and I'm, I'm sure you know you may well have seen uh, like footage and photographs of this where the rivers are literally blue um, and uh, it's been calculated that it takes about three kilograms of chemicals to make a single pair of jeans, somewhere like uh, Xintang in China. Um, and of course, what happens then is that this, these chemicals don't just stay in the rivers and the lakes, they seep into the, uh, into the soil and into the crops. So then you have things like lead and cadmium and, and copper ending up in the soil and in the food that, you know, that, that we consume. Um, uh, and a positive thing um, about cotton is that you have an alternative. There is organic cotton, which um, many, you know, some people in the fashion industry really champion. And organic cotton is interesting because it eliminates the use of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. And uh, the water pollution impact of organic cotton has been found to be about 98% less than non-organic uh, cotton. Uh, so yeah, so that's something worth, uh, always worth investigating. Um, but then, so if we go back to this pair of jeans, so the cotton has been grown, uh, like they've been dyed and finished, and this wastewater has been pumped out into the, into the land. But so you've got a pair of like perfect dark blue jeans. Uh, you know, we've had three kilograms of chemicals used to produce these, these genes. But even though uh, all of this dye is used, what happens next is that, of course, a lot of uh, brands don't want to sell like perfect, just dark blue genes. And so then uh, they need to be faded. You know, they need, to, be, they need to, to look a bit more worn in. Um, and there are some, there are various techniques for fading jeans. And one of the ones that has become famous or infamous is the sanding technique, uh, where either people literally sand them by hand or they blast them with these kind of sand guns just to get the faded uh, patterns on jeans. Or um, alternatively, there's some very horrible chemicals like potassium permanganate, which also get used. And um, you know, masks, face masks have been in the news an awful lot at the moment, you know, to protect us all from coronavirus. But you've got to imagine in these factories where it's not just viruses, but really serious uh, chemicals and all this dust uh, from these genes, uh, which is floating in the air. And sometimes 
these workers are given masks and sometimes they don't have masks so they're working uh, they're working and just inhaling all of this uh, toxic dust uh, which has led to you know very like high rates of um of lung diseases and emphysema and things like that uh, and of course fashion is such a, a deregulated industry that it's hard to know whether or not even what's being said um, it's hard to know somewhere like Egypt or Pakistan or Bangladesh where whether the people are working on genes in safe conditions you know if we think about that factory Ali Enterprises in Pakistan where there weren't even you know where the fire escapes were locked and the certificate was saying uh, that this factory was safe. It's like then how, you know, how can you really trust uh, if they say, oh yes, you know, we give all of our workers uh, genes. And then of course, interestingly, just within the genes themselves, we like our genes a bit stretchy. So they, you know, so added into the uh, cotton is things like spandex um, or nylon, uh, which are fabrics which are made of oil as well. So you have a real, like you know real like geopolitical issues uh, just um, within like just within our genes and um, you know so this is like this is this is the reality of the fashion industry and you know you might be thinking like oh, god like it's exhausting sort of thinking about it and, and writing about it all the time um, and a lot of people just say to me like you know like why are like, why are things such a mess like why are things so bad with fashion in particular you know it's the creation of something so beautiful sometimes um, sometimes what's produced is just really boring but it's the creation often of very creative beautiful things so how is it um, that things are so bad and so I want to spend a couple of minutes just answering this question of like why is the fashion industry like this uh, why does it behave like this and the short answer is because it has to. Um, this is the, the logic of the economic system that we are living in. Um, and what I found, you know, I've been writing about fashion for about 10 years now, and what I find is a lot of the time, issues within the fashion industry are described in terms of personal morality. That the way the fashion industry is, <clears throat> is the fault of terrible consumers, you know, who buy cheap clothes and don't care about anything. But I think it's important for us <clears throat> to, <clears throat> excuse me, for us to understand, you know, as people who, who are interested in these issues and interested in how we change the fashion in industry, is that if we describe fashion as a question of personal morality, that we are missing uh, reality. So, and in, in particular, we are missing the question of systemic morality and fashion isn't awful because of individual people. Fashion is awful because of capitalism. So what we see is that the fashion industry is a deregulated, subcontracted industry, which is dependent on selling billions of short life products at a maximum profit. And so under capitalism, what corporations have to do is number one, maximize their profits. And they do this by driving down costs and trying to get their component parts for the clothes that they're selling as cheaply as possible. And I think one thing it's important to remember about the logic of capitalism as well is that there is constant competition between brands, you know, they're all competing against their competitors. So these component parts that the fashion industry is trying to make as cheap and cheap and cheap as possible are two things, basically. Uh, so number one, um, the main, you know, human component part is, number one component part is human labor. And so this is the, the garment workers working in the factories, you know, um, the home workers working at home, uh, the, the transport, all, all of that. So human labor. And unless you're using slaves, and there are slaves within sections of the supply chain, so unless you're using slaves, then you have to pay wages. 
But what you want as a brand is for those wages to be as low as possible. So some people in the fashion industry literally have the job of sourcing the cheapest wages possible. So they go and they find the factory who will make the clothes for the lowest price possible. And what that does is it means an end to things like uh, maternity leave, um, holiday pay and sick pay and things like that, because those are, you know, those are big added costs for a factory and the brands are not paying enough for those things um, to, to be taken care of. Um, and, you know, and, that, and that's how we end up with huge German brands uh, sourcing from factories like Ali Enterprises. Secondly, so the second component part uh, is the environment and it's the planet that we live on. And what that means is that all the materials that make clothes, so uh, cotton and water and the air and oil, all of these things are treated like they are free resources without any consequences. And so what we see is, uh, is um, all of these component parts being sourced as cheaply as possible. And that's how, as part of that, we see environmental standards being incredibly low and we see health and safety standards also being incredibly low. And of course, you know, this is not, these are not problems that just stay in the global south, uh, because as an economic model, this is incredibly, incredibly short termist. And particularly in terms of uh, the environment and the way fashion treats the environment so badly, we are all experiencing uh, the results of this economic model. I mean, um, you know, if you've watched the news in the last two weeks, you, you know, you can't help but have seen the forest fires that are raging across California, absolutely terrif terrifying. And, you know, we saw those, we've seen them in, happening in Greece um, and other parts of Europe as well. Um, flash floods, flash floods that are taking place, you know, from, from Bangladesh to Northern England, um, at, um, you know, every, every single year. Uh, tornadoes as well. Uh, you know, rattling, rattling across the Gulf Coast and the Caribbean in America, um, heat waves, um, ice caps melting. So, so it's, it's all this kind of thing. Um, and that's why I think it's incredibly important that we don't just talk about personal morality and, uh, and changing our individual behavior. Because, you know, we need to talk about this idea of, of systemic morality, of which there is none. Um, and I think it's important because, frankly, if we don't start talking about capitalism and this system and what that is doing and what that's making happen, both in fashion and outside fashion, you know, we will all continue to pay a very high price uh, for what is happening. Um, so to bring things really up to date now, I want to just spend a couple of minutes talking about COVID-19 because COVID-19 and in particular, the fashion industry's response to COVID-19 has without a doubt made all of the things that I've been talking about absolutely like worse. And as you know, as I'm, you know, I'm sure many of you are aware, um, lockdown, as the shops shuttered in lockdown, um, orders were canceled, factories closed, leaving millions of workers without wages and without compensation. And we must always remember that despite these jobs being for the most part pretty awful, they are still absolutely desperately needed. And their loss has meant millions of people lacking the means to buy food for themselves um, and, their, and their families. And the behavior of the brands over the last six months has been terrible. I mean, we've seen enormous multinational corporations uh, refusing even to pay for existing orders, including in some cases, orders that had already been shipped and were sitting quayside in the USA or in Europe. The other thing that brands did is to be, they began to push for some truly outrageous discounts uh, in pushing the factory. So they were asking for 50% discounts or 90% discounts uh, from, from their orders. 
and uh, this is to factories who are all like generally always but certainly at the moment um, on the brink of financial collapse and so what we've seen with COVID-19 is an expectation from the enormous brands in the fashion industry that some of the poorest countries in the world including Bangladesh will subsidize them and will subsidize the the entire industry by being the ones uh, to really really suffer and um, there are entire industrial districts you know I've been interviewing people about this over the last few months there are entire industrial districts where there has been like no work for months you know March April May June no work at all and people garment workers and home workers have been surviving on charity handouts of food which is you know just not an acceptable situation for for such a wealthy industry and also another thing i think it's worth bearing in mind is uh, is the overcrowding of a lot of garment factories and the inability of the people making our clothes to keep clean in a uh, a really crowded space where uh you know maybe maybe there's like like a hundred people working in in this one like one room and uh and there's like one toilet uh with and the tap is broken and there's also no ventilation because the windows have been have been boarded up uh so you know how do you keep clean how do you keep safe from covid in, in a situation uh like that and um so covid covid is an is an interesting moment it's a very dangerous moment and we've certainly seen huge disruption in the fashion industry over the course of this last year. And we are really at a, at a crossroads, I think. So one option is that more environmental controls and more rights for workers are rolled back and gotten rid of as, a, as corporations scramble to make up uh, their lost profits. Um, and you know we're seeing trade unionists and workers so, um, being... Tensi, I'm, I'm very yeah. sorry to interrupt you but um, it's about time we would kind of slowly slowly move to uh, reflecting and then coming to the Q&A so if you keep that in mind that'd be great thank okay. you okay so as I was as I was saying so we're at a crossroads at the moment where Sorry, it really made me lose my train of thought. Hang on. Um, yeah, so where we see, we can either see more environmental controls and more rights for workers get rolled back, which is what we're seeing at the moment. And we're seeing persecution of workers and trade unionists, people being fired, people being put in prison, uh, people being beaten up at the moment for asking for safe working conditions. The other option, um, is that, and I think this is, you know, one of the things we can talk about and reflect upon, is that we take this moment as an opportunity to rethink um, and reset uh, a system which systemically encourages overproduction, environmental uh, destruction, overconsumption, and uh, and which really takes for granted uh, the people who are stitching not just our clothes together, but our entire world. Uh, together and um, you know climate scientists are now predicting that we have 11 years to, to stop uh, runaway climate change so um, so we urgently need change and um, if you come to the the workshop on the shoe industry that I'm doing later this afternoon I will be setting out uh, the three things that immediately need to change um, within the fashion industry and talking more about those and it's basically Uh, trade unions, legislation, and an end to uh, to competitive pricing, as well. So we could, you know, we can talk a lot more about this. But I will wrap up there. Yes, great. Thank you, Tansy.